January 22nd, 1992, I was 11 years old, watching her strap into her seat on the space shuttle. I remember that moment so clearly, watching you about to become the first Canadian woman, the first neurologist in space. I remember how I was feeling, but I really want to know what was going through your head. How were you feeling in that moment? Well, orange is not my favorite color, but <laughs> having said that, I was the first Canadian to wear it, so I was feeling pretty well prepared. It is kind of like being at your peak level when you're going to be doing something. You want to be just like at that moment, and that's how I felt. I thought, gee, I hope we don't have a delay for a day or two because I feel really, really strong right now. What was the overwhelming feeling? Was it excitement? Uh, were you nervous? Combination of both, and I think that if if uh, if I really am honest with with you uh, and everybody else, it would be that there is a tinge of apprehension because I didn't want anything to happen to me in front of my mother, my sister, and my friends. I, I thought that wouldn't be a good start to the day. What was it like when you finally were rocketed up? It's only an eight and a half minute ride on the old shuttle, and <laughs> it is really a rock and roll ride. Inside, we have helmet, had helmets on, and I had a communications cap. Uh, to try to deafen out some of this noise. But I can tell you when the solid rockets fired off, there was no question we were going to go somewhere. And it was just an extraordinarily bumpy, noisy ride. And I thought to myself, I'm inside a Roman candle. Mm. What was I thinking? <laughs> and then you get to your destination, so to speak. Well, in space, you worked as a team to conduct round-the-clock experiments and research. Was there time to appreciate what was going on and what you were experiencing? You raise a good point because I really had to go back to my childhood days uh, thinking about when my sister Barbara and I were building plastic model rockets and space stations together very early on pre-secondary school and trying to grab that moment of that inspiration about wanting to be a spaceman. I, sometimes things get to be a job and it sounds not so good when you say, well, being an astronaut's a job. but. One has to focus on one's work and one's checklist. It was really something I, I, I had to do. And actually about day two when I got to look at the Earth because the commander called me up to look out the flight deck because I had been so busy working. He says, Roberta, you got to see this. you got to take the time. And it was in that moment that I thought to myself, you know, this is more than just doing the science here. I've got to make a better plan. Really? And, you know, I look back at the, you know, the last 30 years and how much has changed since that time the shuttle program was retired. Now astronauts get to space either on a Soyuz rocket or more recently, of course, through those private space companies. What do you think about how space travel has changed over the past decade or so? Well, it's fascinating, and I think it's great. I mean, back in the old days, the shuttle days, at least seven people could fly in space at the same time, and then it's now three with the Soyuz. Uh, system and then now we look at the commercial space flights and we can have maybe few a few more people go into space not just on the same vehicle but on different vehicles so i think the access to space is getting better especially for professionally trained astronauts and people who are doing science and trying to use space as a way of understanding phenomena that we have here on earth to make our earth life better and having said that what, what i think you're referring to as space tourism perhaps mm. is a different story yeah what do you think about that well, one can't tell people how to spend their money, that's for sure, even when the average citizen is the one that's helping them have that money. Uh, but it's also, a, I think, it's a question of, of ethics and a person's value system, what one wants to do with that type of money. And the technology that's developed to go into some of these programs, I think, will, in the long run, benefit, benefit things in society, special engineering. I think right now for people to see that kind of thing being done in an age where we have a COVID ravaged planet and poverty and lack of education and war are still very much part of human behavior, it, it's sometimes it's hard for people to reconcile these things. If given the opportunity, would you go back? I would go to the moon. I, I never was enamored of a space station because I always felt that we should have not done that. I always felt we should go to the moon, but because we have space station, we've been able to do great things. I just hope that when people go to the moon and then onwards to Mars, that it's done in an ethical and inclusive way. 
Now, despite retiring from the astronaut program, you did continue working with NASA and the Canadian Space Agency on research projects. Can you tell us a little bit about that? After my flight, uh, the Canadian Space Agency didn't see that I should go on and train any further as a mission specialist. So I thought, well, you know, if they want my research to end because I'm an astronaut, they're not going to train me anymore. Then what else should I do with all this stuff that I've done? I've set up this research team. And so I, I, I proceeded to get university interest and NASA interest. And so I became the head of an international team, uh, both American and Canadian, looking at aspects of how astronauts accommodate to weightlessness and the return to Earth uh, as well. And I worked uh, with NASA. I partnered with the cardiovascular team. So we had a we trained and we worked with something like two dozen, over two dozen missions to do the science and published in, in well-received uh, peer-reviewed journals. How did traveling to space affect how you see the Earth? It's tough to be able to share this kind of view. I mean, you are surrounded by an Earth behind you. But the reality is that it is a planet. And though you can see those photographs when you look at it, it's not unless you're in that moment and you're floating and you see it with your own eyes mm. and it is part of, becomes part of your soul. Then you realize that you are on a planet. Then life on this planet becomes quite precious. I bet. And then you mentioned photography and photographs. You're passionate about photography and science. So I have to assume you've been following the news about the James Webb Space Telescope as closely as we have on this show here at your morning. How do you hope this telescope improves what we know about space? We're always trying to find things that we didn't know, uh, that we didn't think were there. In fact, we're, we want to describe new phenomena. We, we actually want to know that there's something else out there besides us. So all of these things, these beautiful pictures that we can get back, higher resolution than the, than the Hubble seeing farther, all those kinds of things and new phenomena really add to our collective view of ourselves, let alone our scientific knowledge. And it provides us an opportunity to think about how we can improve that even for the next generation telescopes or how do we prove that, improve that for other ways that we want to be able to stretch our minds and our, and our, our thoughts and vision farther than we have now. So it's always trying to push the boundaries of what we can see and understand. Well, it is certainly a privilege to talk to you today. You're such an inspiration for so many Canadians. Doctor, thanks for joining us this morning. My pleasure. Thank you.